So I'll introduce myself. My name is Matt Chain. I've been doing, uh, I started in QA over 20 years ago. Um, I started as an intern setting up a lot of systems um, over at Nobel. And one of the things that drove me nuts was not, have, not having anything to automate with and doing the same thing over and over again. At one point, I remember um, I didn't build a lot of the tools there. We had a lot of engineers building other, other tools. But one of the systems that we used was called the Nobel Super Lab. We had over 1,100 systems in there uh, that we could schedule and utilize at any uh, point in time. The Super Lab staff, they built a lot of automation tools. But then in our, in our personal test environments, I had 60 physical machines that was allocated to me that I could use at any time. When I was doing one of the last projects I worked on at Novell was a system update feature to push and deploy out system updates to workstation servers, whether it's uh, Unix, Linux, Solaris, Windows, um, all different flavors. To set up that environment would take me about four to five hours per day just to set it up before I can do, do my test. My test would literally take about 10 to 15, 15 minutes to validate, and then I have to restart the process again. So that time it was frustrating, but with the right automation tools, got it down to about 20 minutes for a setup, come back from lunch, long, a short lunch, and it's all ready to go. So I got my velocity up to about three or four times a day where I can run the same test. And that's where I got the, the, the drive to just, we got to automate everything. We've got to make it as, as reproducible as possible and increase our velocity. So this, uh, my talk today, or my discussion today, is on automating your web, mobile, and your desktop um, application. The reason why I wrote this, because I get a lot of people coming to me and ask, asking me about, I want to mo automate mobile, and I want to automate web. How do I identify a framework or a set of tools that will work with both so that it's easier to maintain? Well, I'm going to show you that. And on top of that, I'm going to show you the same framework where you utilize the same exact development framework, whether it's web, mobile, or desktop, runs on Linux, runs on Mac, runs on Windows. It doesn't matter what it is. We will automate it within one same, uh, the identical development environment. Um, so hopefully that will help you guys uh, drive some of your dire uh, direction about what to choose. So the topic that I'm going to go after today is WebDriver, Selenium WebDriver. So Selenium's primary use is, is for automating web applications. Back years ago, that's what it was invented to do. The Selenium IDE was built so you can do record and playback. Um, you can do functional tests without having a team to learn a, a specific scripting language. Very easy to use. The IDE is a, a browser plugin. So basically, you install the plugin, and you hit record, and it will record your scripts as if you are a user using the application. And you can go back and, and play it back. Um, you can uh, uh, modify the parameters if you need to. So the history. So Selenium was originally developed by Jason Huggins in 2004 as an internal tool to the ThoughtWorks. Around 2004, 2005 is when I started looking into it when they went beta. So Huggins uh, was later joined by other programmers and testers at ThoughtWorks. Uh, Paul Huggins joined the team and steered the development for the second iteration, which is the Selenium Remote Control. So before, it was only a desktop application. You can only run from your desktop. If you downloaded it, you hit play. Works great. Somebody makes a code change, you hit play. does not work. And, and then the other thing is, if, I, if I'm running my, my automation on my desktop, whatever actions I'm doing with checking email and all that stuff, I can't touch the machine. So it is great for a small little blip to validate a set of tests, which is what a lot of times what I did. Is I'll create the error scenario, give it to developers, and say, here, play this script. And they can follow that step by step. It's increased our velocity a little bit. They didn't have to read you know, a 30-step uh, document or a bug um, to, get, to figure out what I was doing. But it's still slow. And a lot of words always gets lost in translation. So the picture is always a lot better. <clears throat> so the remote control was a feature that allowed you to run your automation from your local desktop to a remote machine. So at that point, you didn't have to worry about the pop-up showing up on your desktop or you checking email. So if you have 30 tests, you can hit play and it'll run in the background. Pretty, pretty awesome. <clears throat> so 
So in 2005, Dan and Nelson, uh, I, don't even, I don't even want to try to pronounce their last names. Um, I'll probably butcher it. Um, they made an offer to accept a series of patches um, that transform Selenium RC into what it is known for today. A little more history. 2007, Huggins joined Google. Uh, together with Jennifer uh, Bevan, he continued development and stabilization of Selenium RC. Selenium RC was not stable before. You would start it, sometimes it crashes, sometimes it runs, sometimes it would just lose communication and then get, get back communication again. It was not stable. <clears throat> So at the same time, Simon Stewart at ThoughtWorks developed a superior automation tool called WebDriver. Um, in 2009, after a meeting between the developers at Google Test Conference, Automation Test Conference, it was decided that they merged the two together. So that's what we can have now today known as Selenium WebDriver, or Selenium 2.0. Um, back a little more history. So Selenium 1.0, it was basically, Selenium actually sits as a JavaScript. It just sits as, as a JavaScript injected onto your browser. All watches for is your DOM. Before, you would say, go find this element somewhere on the page. If you find it, great, come back with something. Where, and it's, it's a singular step. Whether if you want to uh, enter a piece of data or click a button, you have to do it all within one step. But 2.0, you can grab your element and you have a thread that's holding onto that element. And with that thread, you can do multiple actions. You can do a right click on it, you can click into it. You can type text into it. You can do whatever you want to it as long as that page hasn't changed and the thread hasn't been lost yet. So it's a lot more long, longer living um, access to an element on the web page. <clears throat> so in 2008, uh, Philippe at ThoughtWorks, he made the Selenium Grid. So Selenium Grid kind of works piggybacks off of Selenium RC, so you can do a remote control. But Selenium Grid allows you to be a hub and it will connect to remote nodes and it will allow you to run multiple tests at the same time. So now you see the progression of how we're going to increase our velocity. To minimize execution time, um, it, uh, there's not anything that bad to say about it. So why the name Selenium? You guys started back automation back in the days. Remember a company called Mercury Interactive? Um, made it as a joke that uh, he's mocking mercury, saying that you can only cure mercury poisoning by taking selenium supplements. So that's the reason why they came up with selenium. It was a direct com competition to um, to mercury. At Nova, we did have a license for Mercury Interactive. It was $2 million a year for licenses, and that included Load Runner. Um, it was a great tool for what we needed, but every time we faced a challenge of the code does not support X feature in at, that we need to test, we would contact Mercury Interactive. Two, three months later, we'd get a DLL that we get sent back to us and say, here's your new feature that will handle that. It worked every time. And it, it was great support. But again, sometimes it's one month, sometimes three months to get that, uh, that DLL uh, work through all the kinks and whatnot and have them test it. So it wasn't very efficient for us. And by that time, if you're in a waterfall, waterfall framework, it works, works great. But now we're in Agile. If you work, wait two or three months, you probably forgot where you're developing at the same time during that time. Or you just probably threw that feature out. Or you got another competitor who beat you to market. There are startup companies that get started within three to six months, let alone try to wait for DLL to get delivered to you. So, so some of the competing products. Oops. Test complete, one runner. Teller Test Studio, Visual Studio Test Pro. The list is pretty extensive. And this is only a small fraction of all the tools out there. Some of these are cheap, uh, up around the range of $600 for a year for a single license. Some of them are free. Some of them are commercial licenses. Um, back in the day, you would buy, you would purchase a a annual license, but a lot of these are, are cloud-based now, and the cloud-based charges you per hour, so it actually gets more expensive. Um, if you notice right here, I do have a couple open source ones, a like Catalan Studio, Cypress IO, um, Protractor, Webdriver IO. These frameworks basically work off the same thing as Web WebDriver. All they are is another wrapper to your WebDriver. 
Um, they try to abstract some of the complexities to using WebDriver, but once you understand the concepts of WebDriver, it's, a lot, it's not that hard to, to utilize the code and to write the code yourself. If you use one of these and you have a feature in your company that uh, you absolutely need to automate, it might not support it. So at that point, what do you do? You wait for them to support it, submit a ticket, wait for a pull request, what do you do? So some of these uh, open source frameworks, they do allow you to contribute to their project. So you write your code, do a, a pull request, six months, a year, two years later, um, they might merge it back into their master. Sometimes I don't want to wait that long. Most there are companies who go through staff, rotate staff every two years. By that time, you forgot what your pull request was, or nobody even really cares at that point. But I'm not saying these are bad, but these are the off other options. For me, the reason why I want people to start utilizing WebDriver in itself is if you think about if you think about driving a car, anybody can drive a car. So if you learn how to drive a manual, you can drive 100% of the vehicles in this world. If you learn how to drive automatic, you're limited to just the automatic. You go to Europe, you pay extra. So that's the same thing with these frameworks. If you don't understand WebDriver um, as, a, as a protocol, then these are going to cost you more money in the future. The other thing is, WebDriver is a protocol. So if you think about a uh, Star Wars, C-3PO, how many languages do you know? It's a protocol droid that understands what 2 million plus languages. Is that what it is? So he basically can communicate with pretty much everybody out there. Well, that's what WebDriver is. WebDriver is not a language. It's a protocol. So you have other languages that are communicating with it that can plug into it. So you have this one framework that automates pretty much everything, and then you just have to figure out how to communicate with your web driver. It works with pretty much everything out there. C Sharp, Groovy, Java, Perl, PHP, Python, Ruby, Node, Scala. It's six million, by the way. Six million? Six million languages. Yeah, I only have eight. I don't know how many languages out there, but apparently, you know, six million. That's pretty awesome. So this isn't quite up to this par of C3PO, but eight languages, plus or minus a few, um, pretty good. Can I ask a question? How many people in here are you controlling right now? Right. Right. So you guys are pretty well on the browser, and using it as technology. Yeah, so you guys understand some of this. Again, it works on Windows, Linux, Mac OS. It's open source software, and it's not open source to the point where you can't use it for commercial license. A lot of these uh, the free companies out there, they'll say you can use it for personal use, but the second you start making money, you get to pay us money. Okay, and sometimes, sometimes paying up it determines if you really want to use that tool or not. Some companies, you have a lot of budget. Some com companies, you don't have a budget. Sometimes it's a proof of concept. You don't want to be paying money for something that you might and might not use. Web browsers. It supports a lot of web browsers. Pretty much everything, whoops, pretty much everything under the sun, it will support. Some better than others. Yes, yeah, some better than the others. Mm -hmm. But the, it's not because the web driver doesn't support it. It's because the connectors into a driver does not support it very well. And I'll go into that. <clears throat> the Selenium IDE. So it's an integrated development platform, just like any other uh, development. It's an extension, kind of cover that, recording, editing, debugging, test functions. And it's created uh, in 2006 by Shinya uh, Kasatani. And it was donated to the uh, Selenium project. As of version 2x of Selenium IDE for Firefox, it stopped working after Firefox 55. And then we went on this hiatus for almost a whole entire year where there was nothing that was out there. We had Catalan Studio, which is OK, but it still uh, struggled with some of the recording. But, good news, 2018, the people who work at their jobs and contribute to a free open source project without any, any uh, uh, expectation of return on money, they built Selenium 3X. <coughs> so you can use Cantu, you can use Catalan Recorder, you can use all these to record, but again, one is closed source. 
So you can't really modify it if it doesn't record a capture on an element. So how do, what do you do to get around it? There's not a whole lot of options. You're kind of stuck with that option. And me, being a software engineer, I don't like being stuck. Because to me, computer code is all zeros and ones. Why can't I automate it? I might have to figure out some other abstracted way to automate it, but it's all zeros and ones. So scripts can be automatically recorded, kind of like what I mentioned. Um, they're recorded in a language called Solanese. Once you get your scripts recorded, um, well, the scripts record all the command actions, whether you're clicking, whether you're uh, uh, selecting options, clicking drop down. If basically whatever you can do as a user, it will emulate for you. And it helps you retrieve data off the page. Unfortunately, right now, Slam IDE 3X can only export the Salonese language into Java, but they are actively working on exporting. If you remember, for so those of you who use Selenium IDE 2.0, you can export in Python, Java, uh, C Sharp, and I want to say one other language, but I don't know what it is. But anyway, you can, multi, you can export in Ruby. You can export in multiple languages. It actually builds out your whole entire test framework, which is awesome. Um, it helps you with your annotations, helps you with uh, your test steps. It gives you a really good framework to start off with, but unfortunately we lost that. But right now you still do have Java. Why, why did it do that? With the 2.0 versus this? So 2.0 you can do a lot, 2.0 you can't? Yeah, so reason why, reason why is if you look at Firefox 55, and about, same t about six months before with Chrome, the security architecture of the browser is completely changed. And so getting access to those was, was a different way. So that it took time. Um, for somebody to build up a new plugin that would work with that. So is the solution just to stay on 2.0 No, Selenium 2.0, the IDE 2.0 does not work and hasn't been working, so use 3.0. The nice thing with 3.0, 3.0, all the commands will work with any command that you used in the past. So it's constantly updated. You're not, you're never, you can mix and match some of these versions just fine. The only caveat is the browser version versus the driver op, uh, version. And I'll show, go into that a little uh, more de into detail. So Slam RC is written in Java, accepts command via uh, HTTP. It makes it possible to write automation scripts in any language you choose from. So RC has been deprecated, and it's built into WebDriver now. It's all part of the same package. So how do, I, so how do you get started? So those of you guys who have started, hopefully this is a review, but if you haven't started yet, you need the browser directors. This is how you're going to communicate. You need a program language. We're going to cover an example using Java today. The reason why I want to use Java is because I'm going to show you how to do, use Java to automate your web, your mobile, and your desktop application, not just in using the web driver protocol, not just using a bunch of other tools out there, because I, I know there's plenty of other tools you can do everything with, but I don't want to have to remember how to program in four or five different frameworks, let alone try to program in one. Um, friend developer, most developers nowadays are, are full stack. Having them understand how to do everything in JavaScript and having them a full understanding of how to write web services and uh, in, in anything else in Java, it's already a feat in itself. Same thing with, with automation. So the testing framework we're going to talk about today is TestNG. There's other test frameworks out there. There's lots of different combinations that you can choose from. Uh, Maven, software management tool, build and deploy, use Jenkins. Okay, and we're going to cover this. Code repository, you can use Git, Bitbucket, Subversion, any of these. <coughs> Here's the browser drivers that exist. So back to why some work better than the others. Well, it's the support of these drivers. These drivers are written by open source community. Somebody has free time, they're going to update it. Chrome driver right now seems to be the most updated. It's always, it, but also Chrome, every two, three versions of Chrome uh, updates, you get a new web driver. Kind of a pain in the butt. But there are libraries out there that will automatically go to the Chrome driver repo and look for the latest version and download it for you before you join automation. Um, Gecko driver, that's for Firefox, Internet Explorer, self-explanatory. Remote web driver is what you have to use if you want, if you don't want to run your uh, your automation, your local machine. 
Uh, you have to use a remote web driver. You pass remo the remote web driver what browser type you want, and it'll kick it off, just like I would on the desktop. Uh, Microsoft Web Driver, uh, that is for Edge. Um, if you're off of driver, HTML, unit driver, ghost driver, phantom JS. Phantom JS has kind of gone up, it's kind of disappeared, and same with event firing web driver. So some of these projects are not main, uh, maintained anymore. So how do you get started in Java? Install the SDA, SDK. Pick your favorite IDE, create a new project, select Maven for the project, give it a group ID and artifact and version, enable the auto imports. Once you enable auto imports, if whatever uh, you add to your, uh, your package dependencies, it will automatically update for you. So Maven describes how the software is built, describes its dependencies. Uh, it's built in XML, uh, tells the whole entire project where all your code repos are, all your dependency libraries. It comes with a predefined set of targets um, for the packages and dynamically download and the libraries and build it into a compilable project. You can have local, uh, central, or remote uh, repos. Maven structure is pretty, pretty easy. It's your project home, your source main Java. Uh, that's where you can cont contain all your deliverables. So usually I recommend people put your, your core functions for your automation into Java main and your Java resources probably put your binaries, put your data uh, uh, providers. Um, you can also do test resources for your test data, and then you also have to test Java. That's where you put your test script itself. Try to separate these, the layers so that you don't want to, if you want to modify a script, I recommend people changing their data rather than changing the script and changing their core functionality. This is Pretty much the structure. Maven commands. There's lots of Maven commands. Uh, Maven install, Maven test, Maven deploy, Maven compile. Uh, basically, it will compile your project for you and run your test. Uh, in other frameworks, in Node, you, if you're using Mocha, you do Mocha, uh, whatever. If you're using, uh, you can use npm start, npm stop. Uh, just different shortcuts, basically. Maven uses a pom.xml file to manage all your library dependencies. So your pages, your project object model, unfortunately in, um, uh, in automation you also have the page object model, which is also a pom, and then you also have a project object model, which is also a pom. Some people get confused. Uh, your dependency is pretty easy to, to declare. Dependencies, but your de dependency version. If you go to Maven repository, that has all the open source libraries out there that you would ever need to pretty much automate anything that you would think of. Or you can just go to Google and do a search, Maven Web Driver. Once you find the artifact, it'll give you something like this. This is what you would add to your POM file. Once you add it, if you enable auto import, it'll start downloading these library versions. If you want to change your version, you can change your version. It's not too bad. It's pretty easy to, to do. Worst Selenium libraries, you gotta have your uh, your driver object. So first you have to tell it, download my Selenium uh, libraries, then download my, my drivers, <clears throat> so I can communicate with them. Remember, web driver is just a protocol, so you gotta have something to kind of speak in that same language to it. TestNG is used for reporting. So you can, to add TestNG, you do that. If you want to use Allure, um, I know a lot of people are using Allure. I'm not a fan of the, either one of these two because it is single build, uh, build status. So if you run 30, if you run your test 30 times during the day, you're gonna get 30 different reports you gotta parse through. Um, you basically have to have a human eye to go through every 30 reports to see which one's failing, which test failed. If you do have a test failed, when did it start failing? If it's a previous day, you're gonna go through maybe 40, 50, 60 reports. It's not very efficient. The testing, TestNG is a testing framework, gives you annotations, created by Cedric Bust, inspired by JUnit and NUnit. So basically it's an extension of JUnit and NUnit. Everything that exists in JUnit and NUnit is part of uh, TestNG as well. Um, the goal of TestNG is to cover a wider range of testing categories, whether it's unit, functional, end-to-end, -end, or integration. 
utilize configuration file to run the test. Remember what I said earlier, I don't like people to change my code to change the test. If you want to change the test, change the configuration, change a piece of data, but leave the code the same. That way you guys, it's easier to flip back and forth to see what's causing failure versus what's not causing failure. Test MG supports, has annotation support. You can parameterize and, da and use data-driven testing. Supports multiple instances of the same class. It's got a really flexible execution model. And you can concurrently run your tests, whether you run it by test, by classes, by suites. Test engine parameters are key value pairs. So if you want to put in a parameter uh, name is country, your value is going to be US. So you can say, what is the value of my country? You can say that is US. And based on that value, you can you can parameterize your test, say I want to go to the US market, or I want to go to a different market. So in your file, in your uh, Java file for your test, it would just be at parameters with the value of country, and then in your test, uh, it would just be string country. And now you've taken whatever is in the configuration file and you pass it into your uh, into your Java test. Test annotations. These are the things that a lot of people um, struggle with because it is one extra step. But once you set it up. It's actually awesome. So before suite, every step that has to take place before you run a suite, that's where you put your steps. Anything before a test, that's where you run before a test. Or before a class, before a group, before a method. This is what helps you set up your, your structure. So if you have 30 tests, the at test inside of a Java file, it will determine if it's, at, if it's before a method. Before I run every test, it's going to run that same step. So it basically creates a rendezvous point. So if you're if you have 30 tests inside of a script, one test fails, it doesn't mean the rest of the tests have to fail. You can give it a rendezvous point saying that here's my teardown. After my teardown, close out my browser, clean out whatever you need to, reset my login, go back to this point and start it back up again. So your test can be isolated and you only have one set of uh, setup steps. I'm trying to simplify um, uh, step duplications. Setting up a test. So here you can see you have a before suite, after suite. You don't need to use those. You can leave it empty. You don't have, they're not required to be in your test. Here in the before class, in this example, I'm using to set up my web driver. Once I set up my web driver object, I pass it into my, uh, my class, uh, yeah, my class level uh, variable for the web driver. And then at the after class, I do driver.quit. That cleans up my browser. So here, if you're trying to set up a test, these will be two different sets of tests. One test would actually go to google.com, and the other test would be to get the title. Surprisingly, a lot of people don't actually verify the page title of their, of their test. They say, I click this button, it's supposed to go to the next page. Have you verified it yet? Nope. How do you know when the next page? I get to see it. They run the code on my, my local machine. <clears throat> so why use test and GTRAN test? You can easily configure multi-threading. I think this is the single most uh, powerful feature with test ng. I don't have to worry about maintaining my, my threads. I don't have to worry about code being as, as thread safe as um, most developers would have it. You can run the test whenever you do the Maven build. You can run it as a post up after Maven build. You can use it as a trigger. Um, you can include all your dependencies. So there's a lot of different things that you can do once you understand how to put piece together these structures. Test ng example. Here I will pass in a remote hub. That's where I'm going to run my, my automation scripts. I'm going to run it from that uh, local machine 196.1 or 192.168.11 uh, as a hub. I'm going to tell it to run my Chrome. And then I'm going to say, go to the Google, uh, the US Google search page. I'll pass it the value of US, and in the URL up there, I can say without com slash US or whatever market you want to choose from, however you handle that. 
If you want a data file, you can also say I want to use everything in the file dot file one dot cvsv to have all my search parameters, have my validation parameters, whatever you want in there, you can utilize your test. And also, if you notice that thread count up there, that is how you do the multi-threading. Ideally, per physical workstation, five to eight threads is what you want. After that, you're going to be in the limitation of between your CPU and your hard drive. If you have a solid state drive, you can probably run 10 threads at the same time on a single machine. If you have a spinner drive, five is usually when you start getting weird behaviors. Uh, browser's not opening up quickly enough to so get a lot of timeouts. Data provider. You can write your own data provider, or you can just use a CS, uh, uh, Excel <coughs> spreadsheet or CSV. The data provider is where you would put whatever piece of data you want. This is where you would change your test. So what you do is you write your automation so that it can accept any type of parameter you want to. If I, you have a user, I need to know what the user's name is, age, uh, whatever functions the user can do, whatever values they can use. That's my persona for my automation. So if I want persona one versus persona two, I already know what the data provider is going to provide me. So when I run my test, I say I want persona one. I know all the steps that's going to be required to set up that user, and I can utilize the data from that user. So again, I'm not changing my test. I'm only changing the data here. <clears throat> test engine generates a gen generates report HTML XML format. Um, there's other reporting uh, plugins you can use. Uh, report ng, PDF ng report, the test ng XLT that's been deprecated, or you can use the lure. They're not my favorite, but it is an option. So your code interacts with the browser driver that interacts with the browser. This is the function where you have to have a protocol droid. Remember that protocol droid? You still have to have some type of communication between your browser driver. When you write your code, you're actually talking to the browser driver. You don't actually talk to the protocol directly. Think of it as, as a proxy. So to start, you set your property to whatever you want. If you want Chrome driver, tell it the path where your uh, Chrome driver executable is, new, and then you do the driver.get, that will pull up google.com. There's lots of common, uh, there's lots of web driver uh, commands and functions. Um, most of them are pretty self-explanatory. Driver.get gets the web page. Driver.get title pulls what, uh, the page title from your uh, from your web page. Uh, find element that finds one of the elements on your web page. If you do a find elements, return you a list of elements. Element.click pretty ex explanatory. Find the button, click it. Uh, send keys if you want to send keystrokes, where you can uh, emulate an enter key or a tap key. Uh, page get page source. That's a great option to validate your page actually displays something. You do a get page source and you do a dot contain if it or dot include. See if it has the word exception in it. It's a great way to see if some piece of code blew up your web page. The get text returns the inner and display text of your browser. So if you have a certain piece of text, whether it's a price, if you're doing a shopping cart, you can grab that data off the page. A lot of people I talk to, they they instead of validating something, they say, yeah, I ran to the last page and it didn't throw up throw an error, so my test passed. You didn't have you, the page was blank. How did you how did you say your page passed? It didn't pass. <clears throat> well, it didn't throw an error, so it passed. Wrong. Uh, get attribute. Remember, everything inside of an HTML is an XML document. So anything of an attribute is anything within the um, open and close. Um, angle brackets or the allocators. So in this example here, get attribute href of return HPS google.com. Your element locators. You can locate by link, by partial link, class name. Uh, class name would just be a, a BTN in that example. You can uh, do by name. That's mostly used for uh, inputs, buttons, select, text areas. Uh, by tag name, whether it's H1, H2, HTML, um, or by CSS selector. This one here with the hash represents the ID of the element. I hear a lot of people say they hate XPath. 
because XPath is too rigid. So XPath stands for XML Path Language. It gives you a, a directory or a tree view of everything inside your web page. So once you identify an element, you can go up or down that directory view, just like how you would on your file system. XPath contains over 200 built-in functions. Most people don't realize there's over 200 built-in functions. They think that the only thing that is there is this absolute path. Because if you use Chrome and you say, find me XPath, copy XPath, if it doesn't have any unique identifiers, it will give you this absolute path. And the second that somebody changes the, uh, the DOM structure, your automation fails. And then you're going to go back and modify 5, 10, 15, 100 different elements. I remember working on one of the projects I had. We had, it was a JSF application, and the IDs were dynamically generated at compile time inside a Java code. So every time a de developer adds one button to the project, it re-indexes uh, all the element names. There's no way to use absolute path to make that work. So you can use relative path. Relative path is great if developers give you some uh, type of unique identifier. But the nice thing with XPath, it doesn't depend on ID. That's at, where it says at ID, it's any key value pair that you can identify inside your DOM. You can also do contains. You can do starts with. You can do axes. Follow, ancestor, child, proceeding, following siblings, parent, descendant. These are, these are not made up words. These are all part of the functions inside XPath. How do you use an action builder? This is how you would do the, the mouse and your keyboard. Um, it handles all your, everything that you would do on, a, on your machine. You do a click and hold, context click, context click is right click, uh, double click, these are pretty self-explanatory, drag and drop, have a habit of target and source. How do you emulate one? You have to figure out the X and Y. When you do, in WebDriver, when you do a driver.find element, when you find that element, you can get the X and Y coordinates of that element relative to a page or relative to whatever element you have. If you say, I want to do an offset of that, whenever you find an element, your center spot of that button is exactly where it's going to identify. So you can say, I don't have an, I can't, if I'm using Flex uh, as my, as my um, application, if you don't have IDs within that, you can at least figure out how wide your 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 uh, your element is. Once you figure out how wide your element is, then you can target based on pixels of where your tabs and whatever buttons you have on the pages. So yeah, it's a little more troublesome, but you can build something within to that. To do the move by offset, um, you say I want to move by offset five minus five, then you'll go five over and five up. There's tons of other parameters. Do a dot release. That will be when you pick up your mouse. So in this example here, <clears throat> I'm going to create a new uh, builder. And the builder is going to take a series of actions. Here I'm going to move to the t uh, element text username. Do a dot click. So I'm going to set my focus into that username text field. Do a key down. I'm going to do the key dot shift. I'm going to hold down the shift key and enter. And inside that text field, I'm going to send the keys hello. So now the text that's going to be displayed is all in caps, hello. And then here I'll do a key up. It releases the, the shift key. And do a double click on the username. Now, if you do a double click on text field, a lot of times it'll highlight the whole entire uh, word that you typed. And you'll do a context click. Uh, click. So open the right, the, the options menu. And then it'll do a build. At that point, you only told it what series of steps you want to take. When you do the series of actions dot perform, that's when it actually performs the stuff. So you can you can you can line up these uh, command. You can put a whole entire set of command chains in there all you want, and then it will, it will perform that. <clears throat> this is a little bit small. Yes. Do you have to have all those elements on the page when you compile that? Yes. So you couldn't do it without breaking in the test and navigating. Yes. 
So one thing with a web driver is that it has to exist on a page and has to be able to be visible before it can inter interact with it. You can interact with hidden elements as well. But the second, if you, in WebDriver, if you find an element, let's say my steps are find an element, click on the next page, and go back, that locator would have been lost. So that thread is completely gone at that point. So you have to do a find elements again. <clears throat> tools that locate elements. Chrome has the options. Great, great uh, tool. Back in the day, you had to install a Firefox plugin called Web Developer. It was OK. Helped you identify a couple of things, or most of the time it's easier just to do a record and playback. You can use the inspect tool from, uh, from Chrome and Firefox. You can use a debugger. The world today is built for automation. All these tools are out there for everybody to use. Assertions. This is where I get irritated when people say, I'm not asserting on anything. Why not? You got to assert on some piece of data, otherwise, your test is. is doesn't exist, right? What is the saying? If a tree falls in a forest and nobody is there to hear it, did it happen? Same thing with automation. If you didn't do insertion, did you really run the test? Um, a test is considered successful only if it is completed without thrown exception and if your assertion passes. You can do a negative test, but you just have to do a negative assertion. The thing about assertions is that if you do a hard assertion, the com if a command fails, it will lift out the rest of your test steps. You can do soft assertions. Soft assertions don't throw an exception when the assertion fails. And you'll continue to the next statement. So rather than do a hard assertion, you can do verify commands. Um, in some pr uh, languages like Node, because it's, it's a newer framework with WebDriver and Molka, it doesn't have a verify. Most of it's all um, hard assertions. So you have to build in your own kind of soft assertion uh, handling. So with assertions, you can either pass it string values to compare. You can pass it booleans. You can pass an object. It'll compare objects for you. If you want a custom message um, at the end, it takes three parameters. Um, but in whatever message you want. You can do assert true or assert false. You can do equals. You can do not equals. Here's an example of soft assertion. You do a new soft assertion. And notice here is just saying assert equals, assert true. Each one of these will assert and it will fail, but it will only uh, it will execute all of these before it executes assert all. So even if it throws an exception or doesn't match, it will not stop your test. If you did a hard assertion, the second it hits that assert equals hello and hello, um, that, one actually, that one actually passes. That's a bad example. Um, but in, if, that one, if that line failed, it will not execute the next uh, two assertions. So hard assertion, success, assert success, and all of a sudden it pukes and your test ends. So if you're doing multiple assertions on a page, especially for uh, one example, great example is checking any type of web page that has a login and a value you need to check. Ideally, you check for two values. At least the user still logged in and a value that up, the additional value you want to check still exists. If one or the other doesn't exist, your, your code might puke and it'll exit out. You don't want to end your assertion. At that point, you can say well, it's a warning that hey, this page, we, we don't display the user's information. It would be nice to show it, because every other page we show it. <clears throat> Automating mobile apps. Cobiton, Squish, SquareTest, KMAX, Robotium, Solindroid, Monkey Runner, Calabash, and Appium. We're going to look at Appium, because Appium is a communication device for the mobile to talk to a driver. Open source. Again, you don't have to pay money for, to use this stuff. It automates native apps, mobile web apps. Mobile web app is a responsive um, uh, page inside your, your browser. Um, you can do a hybrid app. Hybrid app is a wrapper. It's a wrapper around your web view. Um, so you have a web page that uh, you want to wrap 
throw a web view around it. It pulls a, a, it's a local um, web server onto your local device. And I'll show you the example that I have here running the hybrid app. It's cross-platform. Anybody, anybody in the company can develop on it. Some companies have shared devices. Some people use Mac. Some people use PCs. It doesn't matter what, what uh, device you're using. If you write your code well, it'll work on both of the environments. Backing philosophy. Love this philosophy. So you shouldn't have to recompile your app or modify any way in order to automate it. You shouldn't be locked in a specific language or framework to write or run your tests. Mobile application automation framework shouldn't reinvent the wheel when it comes to automation APIs. It does not reinvent anything. It sees it, it's going to interact with it. And it should be open source. Appium uses vendor provided frameworks. These are things that each company, the big behemoth giants out there, provides. XC UI test. UI automation, UI automator one or two, instrumentation, you use Android. Uh, Microsoft back in the day when they were building uh, mobile devices, they were they were building the WinApp driver. So at the heart of Appium, it's a web server, and it exposes a REST API, and that REST API communicates with web driver. Receives connection from a client, listens for the command, and runs it. See a pattern right here? Same language, same concept, same same theory of what it's trying to, uh, trying to do. So how do you add Appium? Same thing. In your palm, the XML file, you add io.appium, Java client. Appium code. Appium does require a little more code, but this is a new driver. This is a new device. So you do have to tell it, I want Appium version X, you want to do plat whatever Android platform, um, you want to give it a name, whatever browser you want to pass it. And then you also have to have a Android driver. Does re Appium kind of works as your remote, web, your remote web driver. So you have to have tell it where your Appium um, proxy is running, basically. The find elements are almost identical to web driver. Driver dot find elements by name, driver by find elements by ID. Tools to locate a web, mobile web element, you can use UI Automator Viewer. It'll give you a whole entire tree structure of, of your DOM. You can use UI Recorder. Let's talk about desktop tools. Auto IT, I think a lot of people use this one, it's free. Test Stack White, Takuli. Kuli is a Windows, it, it records your XY coordinates. Works great if you everybody shares a 19 by 1080p screen, but someone else has 4K screen, it doesn't work very well. Telerik, test complete, go to UI, Ranarex, test complete. I have test complete twice. Interesting. I really like that product, I guess. Um, but we're talking about Winium. Winium is free, again. So use Winium once you understand how to use WebDriver. Automate your desktop application. And most of the functions that you have in WebDriver, um, it exists in Winium. In Selenium, it exists in Winium. There are some certain things that are catered specifically towards web. Obviously, those are not going to work. There are certain things that are catered directly towards the desktop. That's not going to work in Selenium. So there are a little bit of differences. But still, your language, your programming language is still going to be identical. Your design pattern is still going to be identical. Uh, what are you still going through a maturing project or pro uh, process? To add it, see the pattern here? It's the same pattern. You're just adding another library. What do you code? Two different sets of code. If you, if you want to pass more parameters into it, you can pass more parameters into it. But otherwise, it's just whatever applications you want to automate. When in, uh, when driver, uh, when driver dot driver and the new will launch your application. So loading a desktop element, you can use Windows uh, the inspect. Inspect comes with the Windows uh, SDK. It's all free to use. 
enables you to select the UI elements and look at the accessibility data and everything that you do for your desktop. It's the same thing here. Let's talk about Jenkins. So Jenkins is open source implementation of a continuous integration uh, server written in Java. You can be a, as a self-hosted or you can have somebody else host it for you. Works with any language. Works with multiple platforms. And it's, it's extensible. There are tons and tons of plugins. Whatever project you have, whatever whatever code that you're uh, utilizing, as long as it's not in a dot beta format, if your framework's not in is in beta, you might have to contribute to the project. But if you're using a 1.0 release, there's probably a Jenkins plugin already out there for you. And continuous integration is, an ex is not an expense. A lot of people say it's too expensive. It's a mindset. It's an investment. This is how you're going to accelerate what you're trying to do. So to use Jenkins, create a new project. Pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> uh, plug in your, your source code management information. Highlight it our repo and our password for safety reasons. Um, you can have build triggers if you want to build it periodically, every 15 minutes. With some of my automation, I run it every 10 minutes. We had one bug where uh, an order confirmation number was not delivered using one particular payment type. And uh, I ran that test for a whole entire weekend. I had over 3,000 test results coming back and zero failure. So really, it's there's people are saying there's the people and um, the support people are saying no, well, there's a problem in the code. I can't reproduce it. If I can't reproduce it consistently even one time out of 3,000 times. I'm not sure how, where that where that failure exists. So we got to get more details. But this is a great way to to grab the data that you need. The build command. So with Java, the the easiest way by default it's going to run your your testng.xml. If you want to isolate test suites or test functions, you can create your own XML. In your XML, you would say test skip true. That's going to skip the whole entire uh, test ng uh, default. And then you pass into it the specific test suite you want to run as a post step. A modification to your POM file, you just, what is that, four different parameters. And all of this is the default. I'm adding a default test ng. If I want smoke test, I can pass a parameter of smoke test, and it'll kick off everything to smoke test.xml. Or if I want to customize my my suites, I accept all those three of those values. Let's do a web, let's do a demo right now. So this right here. All in, we don't need this. And so here's an example of my test ng, uh, my XML. Here I can say I want 20 threads. It kicks off to a remote server. It'll run. Uh, and right now we have we have six machines running. So if I change this to 30, it'll run five uh, simultaneous tests at the same time on each workstation. I know it's small, but let's see if I can increase it. Sorry, I won't increase. But first test here that we're going to do is we're going to kick off Notepad, do a copy and paste of the string, and close out Notepad. It's an XML file running using test ng parameters. And unfortunately, I need to remember to minimize. Let's do this again. Let's, uh, let's minimize this window here so you can see what's going on. There it goes. OK. Here's my notepad. Of course, it opens up on the wrong side. I run a 4K monitor at home, so I don't usually have this type of problem. 
I'm going to have to open up Notepad and let's reposition this Notepad to over to here to the right. Because Windows like to use the last location that was opened up. Okay, let's try one more time. Come on, paste it in there. It was working earlier. Let's try this other test here. Actually, let's close that out really quick. Just in case something was uh, was left over. Apologize for this. It was working on at home, but the beautiful thing about live demo sometimes it might might not work. Unfortunately, I can't fire anybody. Can't fire myself. I like Steve Jobs. I can fire myself. I'm done. Um, I like Steve Jobs or uh, Steve Ballmer. They can fire whoever I was running a demo for them. But even in the perfect world, there's times that certain things fail. All right, let's try to run this again. Hopefully this time it works. So the other thing with, that I wanted to mention is if you look at this file here, that's my data that I'm passing in. I know it's a little hard to read, but it's right up here. That's double byte characters. If you use a data provider, you can pass in double byte characters. So if you're testing international languages, you can identify certain locators using your display text. And if it matches that text, it'll find that, that uh, button. If you compile your data into your code, your double white characters will come out as little question marks. That doesn't translate to anything. Well, let's see if this works now. Like I said, with Winium, it's still, there's still some kinks that you, they have to work out with it. And hopefully it sets its focus onto it. And of course it doesn't want to work today. At least I opened it up and closed it. Piece of junk, Linium. Okay. But at least you can see it trying to execute. But here we're going to try to do the web now. I'm not changing frameworks, I'm just changing the configuration. And here it's driving the whole entire web. And I like to maximize that screen. There it goes. So in this set of tests, this app, this uh, app right here is a PhoneGap app, and it's a web app. So it'll run on the web and run on a mobile device. We uh, we support 38 different markets in different languages. So having to manually test this is a pain. When I first wrote this single threaded, it will run. It'll take about an hour to run through all the markets. Um, with the multi-threading, it's four minutes across all markets. So in four minutes, I can get all the data I need to validate everything. So I don't have to sit here and manually click it. Because, and also the other thing is I don't remember all these different combinations, but the test, the data is what drives all these selectors. So here you'll notice that little slider is going to about 30%. I put 30% in my data. So I just run through the test, and then at the very end, I'll get an assessment code, and I match my assessment code that I pull off the web page with what I'm expecting in my data sheet. So that way, I don't have to do really anything unless there is a failure, unless I get a positive uh, failure before I get before I need to look at something. And I can run this test every morning. I don't have to wait until I'm free. It doesn't require my my machine. 
we have a farm of six automation machines that just sit there. And they're not, they're not powerful machines. Um, I think they're just i i5 second gen uh, Windows machines with 8 gigs of RAM. They're pretty much a desktop that everybody throws away. That's what we utilize to do our automation. It doesn't cost us anything other than our time. Here's that assessment code, that YF78. Takes a little bit, pulls that, and it'll close out the browser. And here, at the very bottom, you'll see the YF78. I pulled that data off the page. Now let me show you the mobile. Let's see, so this is my phone right here. Let's put it, move it a little bit to the right. Okay. And this is a real phone, it's not smoke and mirrors. Hope I don't get a text or call on it. I hope he doesn't. <laughs> Looks like somebody did try to call me earlier. But here's the app that's running. It's a phone gap app. There's a couple extra steps to this if you notice that uh man, that's dark. There's a video. You'll notice that a lot of these views are gonna be identical to the web. And that's because it's a phone gap app that sucked everything from the web, CSS styles, everything down. If you go to the web and emulate a mobile device, you'll get the exact same view. Here's the languages. This is a different market, different accepting acceptance. Put in your username, put in your password, or not your age. Select the language that you want to use, put in your location. Some same steps. I didn't have to rewrite the whole entire set of tests for the mobile. I wrote three extra, uh, four extra lines of code to pass it that video click and to trigger the mobile device. But everything else is identical. So if I want to change it, if one of these features changes a little bit, I change it in one location, not in 30 different locations. And I'll go on and continue to finish up. Well, let's move on. So we're running a little short on time. And so test reporting. I don't like the reporting that TestMG gives because again, you can't you can't parse through it. I built a custom web app. If you look at automation test results, if you think about the automated test as a message, as a message block, and then you want to filter on message block. We have plenty of examples on there like that. Slack channel, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook. Any of these is just a message. If you do a control F, you can find whatever parameters you want. That's what this is. You can use Drupal to actually build yourself a messaging server that accepts everything using a RESTful web service. You can pass it whatever parameters you want to. If you want to pass a screenshot, you can display a screenshot. Then all you do is just build a front end web uh, a JavaScript um, app that filters and displays all the results. That way it's a lot quicker. If you run 2,000 tests, I think right now in our application, I clean out the database every quarter because our old test data is no longer valid because we do a refresh of, from production. But Per quarter, we'll have about 14 to 20,000 test results in there. I can look back the historical trend for the whole entire quarter of when that test actually failed. So even if I'm not there and the test just keeps on running every day and every quarter or every release, I can see exactly when that test starts failing and why it started failing because I have a screenshot. If a developer, I've used this multiple times in the developer's act, it was working. It's all, I never changed this code for six months. I don't know what, why I broke. And so, well, here's before screenshot, and here's an after screenshot. So you capture this with, how did you capture this? So with an automated test. 
just was working early in the morning and it failed at two o'clock. It's like, oh, that's right. Somebody else changed his other piece of code. There you go. It helps you with quick identification of your automation. So here's the, the test engine you set up, your port or IP or DNS of your hub, your thread. You can use the remote web driver. The Slam server is just a download. To execute it, you have to have Java installed in your workstation. Run it as a, as a standalone hub. And in the uh, known machines, you pass in this extra parameter of, of hub. And node hub, or sorry, node. And then you pass in the value of where the hub is. And that max sessions, that tells you how many sessions max may will run. You can have a combination of five Chrome, Chrome uh, three Firefox, and two IE if you want to. You can make everything all Chrome. You can shape your automation which machines you want to run on. Remote web driver setup is pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's similar to everything else that you've seen. Remote web driver, put in the capabilities. If it's a Chrome, driver.get. Notice that it's a similar pattern that you're developing here. If you want to do more serverless or uh, more uh, parallelization, start doing serverless. Utilize the cloud. You, can, you want to do uh, Lambda functions, even more. If you want to execute 30,000 tests simultaneously, use a Lambda. You can generate a load test with your automation you built. But keep in mind that any time a, a display has to paint, it, it sucks down time. So you might not get ideal performance load, but this will get you very close. People always ask, what's the return on investment? Hard to calculate. How much do you want to spend? How much do you want to invest? But really, the return on investment is gain of investment, cost of investment, divided by cost of investment. That's hard to prove. Automation is not something you just say, well, I know if I spend $30,000 on automation, I can get $60,000 back on return on investment as time saving and we can put, make a tangible decision. This guide is available to you guys. So if you guys want to go through, um, so as part of this SDG, we do have a certification. The certification will help you guys set up your development environment. If you want to do Java, you can do the SDG web driver, Java web driver. Um, we also have Python and Node as well. So if you want to change that Java to Node, that will take you to the quick start guide to setting up a Node.js uh, development framework. If you want to do Python, just change that to Python. So that way you guys can get started really quick. I, we do have challenges in there that go through different examples of how do you build automation. There's associated tutorials, um, not written by me, but other people uh, out in the community. But it's a quick little guide to everything that we covered here. If you follow that guide, you'll get you then follow this guide, you will get quickly started and set up everything that you will see that you have done here. Questions? That's it.